Hey guys, it's Emma. Welcome back to my channel. From today's video, I want to start a series on the top A-B testing questions I have seen in data science interviews. This series of videos will include sample size estimation, metric selection, chosen randomization units, Simpson's paradox, and the network effect, etc. Obviously, there are lots of things I want to share with you, and to make it easier for you to watch and learn, I will focus on one topic in each video. So if you are someone who's preparing for data science interviews or getting started to learn data science, then this series of videos will be helpful for you. Before diving into those questions, I want to mention that how A-B testing questions appear in data science interviews. This is a question I got from quite a few students who had never done a data science interview before. So A-B testing is not a standalone interview. It's rare to see any company have an A-B testing interview round. But it commonly appears in data science interviews, especially product case interviews. It means that A-B testing questions are often asked together with product case or product sense questions. For example, what are some pros and cons of YouTube removing dislikes of videos? And how do you design a test to evaluate the effectiveness of this change? As you can tell, it requires not only product knowledge, but also A-B testing knowledge to answer this kind of question. It's hard to provide an insightful and in-depth answer if you don't know much about A-B testing. Now that you know where A-B testing questions occur in data science interviews, let's go over one of the top A-B testing questions that I have seen in data science interviews, and that is to use power analysis to estimate the sample size needed for a test. One last thing before diving into today's topic, the questions in this series of videos require you to have some basic knowledge of A-B testing. If you are new to A-B testing, that's totally fine. I have a playlist for you that you can start from there. I have shared the link in the video description. All right, guys, let's get started. Let's first review the general form of sample size estimation, which is 2 sigma squared z alpha over 2 plus z beta squared over delta squared, whereas sigma squared is an estimate of variance. Alpha is a significance level. It's also the same as type 1 error or false positive rate. Z alpha over 2 is a z-score such that the area to the right of Z alpha over 2 is alpha over 2 under the standard normal curve. Beta is a type 2 error or false negative rate and the same as 1 minus power. And Z beta is a z-score such that the area to the right of Z beta is beta under the standard normal curve. Delta is the difference between control and the treatment. So this is the general form of sample size estimation. It's rare that you will get questions on how to derive this equation during an interview. But if you are interested in learning about the derivation, I have a link to a chapter of a book in the video description, and it has details on the derivation. Even though it's not required to know exactly how to derive the equation, it's helpful to understand how we obtain each component and how each component plays a part in estimating the sample size. When sigma is 0.05 and the beta is 0.2, we can get the rule of sum formula, which is 16 multiplied by sigma squared divided by delta squared. If we want to be more conservative and lower the significance level alpha, we can set alpha to be a smaller value. For instance, when alpha is 0.01, z alpha over 2 becomes 2.23, which is larger than 1.96 when alpha is 0.05. Our coefficient increases from 16 to almost 19. So with decreasing alpha, we need more samples. Intuitively, this makes sense. If we want to decrease type 1 error alpha, we increase our confidence level of the estimation and we need more samples. As our sample size increases, the more information we have, our uncertainty decreases, and we have greater confidence in our estimation. Now let's look at how beta impacts sample size. Beta is type 2 error. It's equal to 1 minus power. So increasing beta means decreasing power and vice versa. Power is often set 0.8 in practice, which means beta is 0.2. Let's say we want to increase power to 0.9, then beta becomes 0.1. In this case, z beta is 1.28, which is larger than 0.84 when beta is 0.2. And the coefficient increases from 16 to 21. It means that increasing our sample size can give us greater power to detect differences. The smaller beta, the greater power, and more samples we need. The next one is variance. Variance estimation should be done before running the experiment. 
it can be obtained from historical data. Generally speaking, companies should have historical data such as system logs or user behavior data for data scientists to query to estimate variance. For companies that have done some A-B tests before, we can estimate the variance from previous A-B tests and AA tests. If no such data is available, we can run an AA test, which is a small experiment, to get an idea of the distribution of the data when there is no treatment aided, and we should continue to improve estimations of variance with more data and experiments for future tests. Finally, let's take a look at delta, the difference between control and the treatment. How do we know delta before running the test? That's the reason to run the test to begin with, right? To know the difference between control and the treatment. The idea is to use the minimum detectable effect. It's also known as practical significance. That is the minimum change that makes sense for the business. For instance, 10 million increase in revenue or 10,000 increase in button click. Just because those values are noisy and can be impacted by many factors, we need a minimum practical difference in order to conclude there is a meaningful impact to the business. As you can tell, when delta becomes smaller, the resulting sample size will become larger. It means when we want to detect smaller changes, we will need more samples. We need large enough samples to accurately estimate the difference because large sample sizes increase the probability of estimating the metrics we are interested in accurately. So to summarize, the lower the alpha, the higher the confidence level and the more samples we need. The lower the beta, the greater the power and the more samples we need. The larger the variance, the more samples needed to collect to run the experiment. The smaller the variance, the less samples needed to be collected to run the experiment. Also, when we want to detect smaller changes, that is, when delta becomes smaller, we will need more samples. All right, guys, I hope the walkthrough of sample size estimation is helpful. In the next video, we will focus on metric selection for A-B testing. I will share with you some general rules that I have found helpful to select metrics for A-B tests. Before I forget, I also have a product case interview cheat sheet that you can find on dateinterviewpro.com. So if you like this video, you may also want to grab the cheat sheet to help you with product case interviews. I offer practical knowledge on data science interviews and learning data science in general. So don't forget to subscribe to this channel so that you will see more content like this. I cannot wait to see you. Bye, guys.